the course of just two decades, the internet and the devices we use to connect to it have become seamless parts of our everyday existence, radically transforming how we communicate with each other and how we receive information about the world. Now, along comes the great revolution of the internet. The internet revolution. The internet revolution. Definitely, this is the internet revolution. In the industrial revolution, if you wanted to change the world, you had to open a factory. In the internet revolution, you only need to open a laptop. But while everyone seems to agree the internet has revolutionized the world, nobody seems to agree whether this revolution has been good or bad for democracy. Does the web help people to be better informed and to be better citizens? Or can an online free-for-all actually be a threat to democracy? Some argue that the internet has given democracy a shot in the arm by giving us unprecedented access to unprecedented amounts of information. It's what I call the democratization of information. You don't have to wait for the evening news to tell you what happened that day. Everybody can access it at the same time. I say having people talking to each other about real issues is always good for democracy. In the process, providing us with a potent tool for exposing authoritarian power. Egypt's revolution gave social media credibility. Egyptians have broken down the barrier of fear. If you want to free a society, just give them internet access. Social media was effectively designed as a tool for the empowerment of the user. While others say the internet is making us more stupid, distracted, disengaged, clueless, and ill-informed. With all of this distraction on the internet, you're not able to actually learn things, therefore you're becoming more stupid. Especially since the rise of fake news. Fake news articles may have influenced the presidential election. Cambridge Analytica used that information harvested to push fake stories and conspiracy blogs to people who might be susceptible to taking them as fact. Clickbaiters plus crazy people are all coming together and creating a global fake news empire. So which is it? And how are we supposed to decide who makes the better case? At a time when the internet and the broader digital revolution are transforming pretty much everything in their path, it's never been more important to ask, whose revolution is this anyway? I'm Robert McChesney, and for years I've been looking at the relationship between our media system and the health of our democracy, asking some pretty basic questions about who owns the media, whose interests big media companies serve, and whether the American people have access to the kinds of information they need to function as engaged democratic citizens rather than just passive consumers and spectators. These questions couldn't be more crucial when it comes to the internet, especially given how quickly and fundamentally it's transformed virtually every aspect of human communication. In our world, the speed and tempo of modern living are increasing at an ever-accelerating rate. Our control over a bewildering environment has been facilitated by new techniques of handling vast amounts of data at incredible speeds. The tool which has made this possible is the high-speed digital computer. It's hard to imagine now, but not too long ago, computers were ruled over by organization men in suits who talked a lot about managing systems and exerting control. Industry has a powerful new tool for improving management control. A machine with many of the characteristics of the human mind, it follows management's instructions exactly. Back then, computers were these massive machines that filled entire rooms in remote corporate settings, operated and understood only by professionals who looked really smart. Hello, Hal, do you read me? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. In fact, if you look at the popular culture in the 1960s and early 1970s, you can see all kinds of examples of computers causing major anxiety. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. This is the voice of world control. When this emotionless creation becomes the master of man, the result is catastrophic. The choice is yours. Obey me and live, or disobey and die. There was a real fear that they would take over the world and evolve into dark instruments of social control the embodiment of the kinds of authoritarianism and mind control technologies predicted by George Orwell's 1984. But then the real 1984 rolled around. 
January 22nd, 1984, to be exact. There's a snap. 46 million American homes were tuned into the third quarter of Super Bowl 18 when a commercial came on that shook the tech world. Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the information glorification. Directed by filmmaker Ridley Scott, the ad introduced the Apple Macintosh personal computer to the American people for the very first time. And its message would stick. In a world of top-down technologies that turn people into passive spectators and tools of the system, the Macintosh personal computer would take a sledgehammer to the Big Brother computer technologies of the past and usher in a revolutionary new era. On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh, and you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. The message from Steve Jobs and other champions of the new technology couldn't have been more clear. The digital revolution promised to be a democratizing revolution. If you look at sort of the process of uh, the technological revolution that we're all in, it's a process of taking very centralized things and making them very democratic, if you will, very individualized. Then along came the internet. For years they've been saying these things would change the world, would mature from adding machines and typewriters to tools of the human spirit. Now, maybe it's coming true because of internet. As affordable broadband internet technology is spread around the globe, the number of people online has skyrocketed. From around 10 million people online in 1995 to almost three and a half billion people today, roughly half the world's population. In the United States, the rate of growth has been especially striking surging from just 14% of Americans online in 1995 to almost 90% today. A total of more than 280 million of us in all, now spending on average about six hours a day online, routinely accessing the internet through our smartphones, tablets, computers, and smart TVs, immersing ourselves in a mind-blowing proliferation of digital content and generating more and more of it ourselves. The result is an ever-expanding universe of data Billions upon billions of text messages and emails, Facebook posts and tweets, Snapchat pictures and Instagram photos, all of it stored on hundreds of millions of hard drives in a handful of massive data centers around the world. The data flows we're talking about are so staggering that on YouTube alone, the amount of video being uploaded is the equivalent of roughly 180,000 feature-length movies a week, meaning that YouTube now generates more content on average in a single week than all of the film and television programs Hollywood has produced in its entire history. And that's just one app, YouTube. In total, it's now estimated that 90% of all the data information ever created in the history of the world has been created over just the last two years. Now, when you look at all of this, when you look at the sheer amount of content ordinary people now have access to, and how quickly all of these changes have happened, there's no doubt we're living through a communication revolution of stunning magnitude. A moment that may prove to be as transformative as the emergence of human speech and language, as the emergence of writing and the printing press. Communication technology is so powerful that they altered the way our species developed. But there's far less agreement about whether this revolution has lived up to its democratic potential and has been a truly democratizing force. <laughs>